can you believe the NBA Finals is tied up? Like, it's tied up. Suns went out 2 nothing. Bucks have now tied it up. The home team has won in every single game. And you can get in on the action with Action247.com. Make sure when you go there, use code DADS100. They will match up to $400 of your first deposit. The Open Championship is happening this weekend. We're halfway through baseball season. You can bet on the majors and AAA at Action247.com. Besides that, before football, try betting on something weird like table tennis. You never know what's going to happen. Just make sure you use code DADS100 when you go to Action247.com. Today's show is also sponsored by our friends at distilleryproducts.com. If you are a bourbon group or you are a store or a distillery and you need custom laser etched glassware at wholesale prices, that means the prices are pretty damn good, y'all. Check out distilleryproducts.com. I am happy to get you in touch with them. It is a family-owned and operated business. Carson, Janie, Vicky, all the good folks over there at distilleryproducts.com. They not only have laser edge glassware, they also have awesome swag like customized flasks and other cool things like drink stirs. Check it all out. Go to distilleryproducts.com, see for yourself, and reach out to me. I would love to get you in touch with them. Today's show is also sponsored by our friends at Orca Coolers. It is summer. Summer is hot. It's hot everywhere. You need a cooler that is going to be able to hold ice. And Orca Coolers has that. They also have awesome tumblers. They have a barrel tumbler. It looks like a little whiskey barrel. Check them all out at orcacoolers.com. Use code DADSEASON and get 20% off your order. That's D-A-D-S-E-A-S-O-N. Make sure to check them out. Get a cooler or a tumbler. I mean, that cooler holds ice three, four, five days, no problem. I mean, you open that thing up after a few days, the ice looks like you just put it in there. Make sure to go to orcacoolers.com and use code DADSEASON season do you know a damn possum can climb a tree i do know a possum can climb a tree so i want to set the scene for people so i come over here and i am going to set up the equipment and zeke is sitting in the kitchen with a damn revolver and i go what are you doing and he goes i'm going outside to kill a possum i'm like you know they eat rats and he's like i don't care it's living under the deck goes outside goes to kill the possum i said well don't get the cops called over here we got a very important person coming to drink whiskey with us goes outside i'm waiting to hear a bang i don't hear anything and then he comes back inside and says damn possum ran up the tree true story everyone my name is john edwards and with me as always is zeke baker and together we make the dad's drinking bourbon wherever you are whatever time it is thank you for making us a part of your day i'm happy you didn't shoot yourself i am also very happy because we have been hanging out with a guy he's an awesome dude he was born in jackson mississippi he went to the berkeley college of music his first band was king billy one of the coolest things about him is you were temporarily an Old Crow Medicine show, and now you are about to release your third album. It's an EP. Mr. Charlie Warsham, welcome to Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Thanks for having me, y'all. This is fun. <laughs> I've got a, a beautiful display of some blonde pours of uh, very beautiful amber liquid in front of me, and it's been fun hanging out with y'all. I'm glad we're in the in the red, as they say. <laughs> And uh, I'm ready to talk about it all and sip our way through it. <laughs> we aren't used to having famous people besides distillers on the show. So this is a new thing for us. Just like I think you coming on a whiskey podcast is a new thing for you. It's my first whiskey podcast, but I'm really into vibes. And you know, the fame thing, it's fame is relative, right? Like none of us will be as famous as cheese <laughs> ever <laughs> or the popular. That is the quote of the night. I really enjoy that. I hope you don't mind that I'm going to read this, but Charlie has a team, Zeke, and that team was reaching out to me, coordinating logistics. And just so you know, his whiskey tastes too, in no particular order. George Dickel Barrel Select, though I love Dickel Rye and Dickel 12 too. Bush Mills, though my Irish whiskey pendulum is beginning to swing back to Jameson. Corsair Triple Smoke, Maker's Mark, Weller Question Mark, 
I may have the wrong brand here, but I was hip to an old whiskey of which their vintage shit is apparently sought after. I thought it was a brand that was no longer around, but apparently Weller is. Pete Ford Scotch whiskeys, Japanese whiskeys. I don't like Jack Daniels. I love smoke and sometimes sweetness, but not much. So anyways, long story short, I could keep reading. I loved it because Charlie had an opinion. And like you came in going, I know what I like. And I was like, this dude's going to be cool to hang out with. Shoot, yeah. Well, it's interesting. And and one of my favorite things about what I do for a living is, to backtrack a little bit, I'm the son of a banker and a teacher. And my mom, the teacher, believes in travel as education. And so by the time I left home, I've been to Europe four or five times. I'd been all over the States and just all over. So I was pretty well traveled for a Mississippi kid. And the side effect of playing music is you're touring. You're constantly traveling. And I happen to do a lot of international travel as well. And I was telling you guys before we started recording, you know, I mean, one of the times I went to the UK to tour, I blocked off three extra days ahead of the tour to spend in Edinburgh, in part to drink scotch, in part to go to the National Museum of Scotland and see the stuffed dolly, the first cloned sheep, which is on display in perpetuity now. That's a whole nother rabbit hole to go down. (laughs) But I love the culture that you get into through the eyes of being a musician because people want to hear your stories when you're coming through with a song. I feel like my brothers in arms are the bartenders and the chefs and we're all the ones out in the wee hours and we're usually drinking something. And for me, a lot of times that ends up being whiskey. Whiskey like music, you can tell a lot about an area by the type of music they're putting out. Mm -hmm. Just like you could tell a lot about an area by the type of whiskey they're putting out. And even within America, Texas whiskey is going to be different than a Kentucky whiskey than is going to be different than a Tennessee whiskey. And like, there's just different identities, even in Scotland, you know, you have the Highland Lowland space side and there's a whole bunch of history behind it. Just like there's a whole bunch of history behind music, the craft side of it and the time and patience it takes and how it evolves over time. And you're not kidding. I mean, the Tennessee whiskey is different than a Kentucky whiskey, but even the whiskey from the hauler, one one holler over in Kentucky might be a little different, and it might have to do with the way the water, the groundwater. It might, who knows? Who know? Or somebody had some crazy idea they wanted to try, and that is the beauty of both worlds to me: whiskey and music. That's a whole rabbit hole that Zeke and I could probably take you down after we stop recording about all the different variables that make whiskey taste different from place. I mean, even within a Rick House, the floor that you have it aging on Mm -hmm. is going to have a definite determination as to how hot the whiskey ends up being not just with music but specifically i'm a bit of a guitar nerd and i love old guitars and it's it's very similar when you talk about vintage guitars certain years i mean some of the best martins ever made were made during well pre-world war ii but some of the most interesting and most sought after martins were made during world war ii and they have bizarre and inconsistent materials that they were made with and they were made by women because the the guys were off fighting (laughs) world war ii and it's just in the story right the story behind any one martin you pick any one off the line from say 1942 uh it's gonna have a really unique story and uh same with it's like picking a different barrel you know picking a a bottle from a different barrel It, it might be everything the same but one barrel down on the line and something happened i was in guitar center i just happened to see this old gibson it was a 1967 i'm like that price ain't right like it was like 500 bucks for a 1967 gibson and i looked on the back and some dumbass had tried to drill four holes into the and i'm like are you shitting me for 500 bucks like this is coming home with me right now yeah and so i have a 1967 lg because some dumbass tried to uh, drill holes in it. Oh, yeah. You see it happen. Oh, that's sad. But it's great that you have the guitar, and I bet those four holes don't keep it from sounding great. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And I used to actually do a thing where every time I got dumped, I would go buy <laughs> a new guitar. <laughs> and <laughs> the reason being is I could play them like they played me. Wow, there you go. I'm not sure you're winning on that one. Just the statement itself. I, I, I don't All know. right. Well, I'll have to think on that for a while. You never know. That could end up being a song. It could be. Next thing you know, like Charlie's next album. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. yeah <laughs> so, somebody, somebody else heard it. John gets no credits. Well, I, <laughs> I don't care. As long as he comes back and drinks some more whiskey with us, we'll be there. We go. Here. You got a deal, man. Y'all now, come out on tour and drink whiskey with me. Hell yeah. Now, this is something we're doing. I, I don't know what to call it. We have five whiskeys on the table, and we're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about your career. We're going to continue to shoot the shit about whatever we want. The idea behind this is you don't know what these are. You have a definite opinion about whiskey, and we want to know what that opinion is. So go through the first one. You have this stuff poured down. Yeah, this um, is number one of five here. Go through. Tell me what you think about it as you're sipping it. Yeah, and so y'all, disclaimer here. I don't know my head from my ass in terms of, you know, oh, I'm smelling notes of cherry and oak. But I'm going to just do my best to express what it is I smell and taste and how I feel about it. Hell, I said something tasted like pepperoni pizza one time. It was a high malt content, and it just reminded me of pizza and beer in college. Yeah. Zeke equates half the shit to kudzu syrup. Whatever it is, All right. go ahead and just... Whatever that factory sense takes you to. Cool. Like, I have a definite opinion about the one that you're drinking right now, but I'm not going to tell you Mm -hmm. because the second I tell you, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I get that. I definitely smell the alcohol and it's got like a smoke, a little bit of smoke in it. Like, or I don't want to say, I don't know if it's smoke or peat, but like, it's reminds me of that marriage between the the sweetness and the, uh, smoky peaty side sometimes peat is in american malt but peat is mostly used in scotch and and other whiskeys because that's what they're using to actually heat so american like bourbon whiskey it might be something where you're mistaking that smoke and peat for oak an older whiskey might have a little more oak well i'll say this and and i have a colorful way of describing things this feels like Taking a sip of this first whiskey, I feel like I just discovered my grandfather's bomb ass suit in the closet. And it's a little loud and it's got a little bit of like scratchy. You know, it's, it's gonna be, I, I can't wear this in the summer, you know. <laughs> um, it may be a little too much. It may be a little too much, but I gotta give it points for style because it's, it's committing to the whiskey that it is. And I feel like, uh, Cool people drink this whiskey. Like people, people who've been through some shit would drink would drink this whiskey. So I like it. I'm not like sure that I'm in love with it yet, but it does get better with every sip. Take a look at this bottle. All right. This is a Blue Note 17 year. It was sourced from Tullahoma, so it was originally Dickel Juice, but it is 17 years old. The proof has gone down, as you could tell over time. Okay. And go ahead and turn that bottle around. See, here we go. And that was one that was picked by two people in this room for the city of Nashville. It actually went around for a distro pick. If you read the label, you could tell what Zeke and I kind of think the tasting note is on this one. So read what's around the picture of the two of us. This is your dad's root beer. Not to put thoughts in anyone's Mm -hmm. head but like it just reminds me of somewhere between like old school like being a kid like a a root beer float like the way it just lingers oh it does you know what too i think my taste buds are still waking up (laughs) and and i haven't had i haven't been drinking that much uh you have a three-month-old of course you haven't been drinking and uh, and i said i have not been drinking whiskey uh like i might have a beer or something lately so i had to get to the altitude and it got warmer and sweeter but in the kind of sweetness I, I like, the further I got into it. And now that you say that, I get that. And it is in the finish. Like, it hit me kind of strong, but that might just be that I haven't been drinking whiskey. Oh, but, no. It's a, the second um, somebody says, like, hey, doesn't this taste like root beer? You're like, oh, man, oh my yeah, God, it does. Yes, it clicks. Well, I'll tell you what else I love is this is crafted in Memphis. I stand by the my grandfather's suit because I think he might have a root beer in his hand wearing that suit. <laughs> and... There's some Memphis in this for me, you know, like, like y'all said at the top, you know, like there is a lot of geography in whiskey making like there is in music. And my life story is so built around the geography, you know, maybe it's just a mental thing, but like connecting this whiskey to Memphis in my head, 
makes me love it even more. Because Memphis was 100 miles north of where I grew up, and it's where I went for my first rock concert, seeing the Rolling Stones. And it, Damn, they was, played Memphis? They played Memphis. <laughs> at the Pyramid, check this out. At the Pyramid, there's no security tour. Johnny Lang opened. My dad took me. I smelled beer, other things. <laughs> uh, saw a naked woman. Like, all the things that you're not supposed to be exposed to as a child, but it was kind of perfect and beautiful. And... I freaking love the Rolling Stones. Well, so we're right around the same age. This is a question that I would have because Stones kind of stopped for a little bit, then Start Me Up came out, and then they started kind of touring again, and then Mick and Keith would fight or whatever. But what year was your first concert? It would have been the uh, early mid nineties. The, the whenever that No Security tour was out. No, so it had to be because Start Me Up was after 94 because windows 94 used it That's in their right. campaign yes so yeah and i mean i'd seen concerts before yeah but not a rock concert and this was at the pyramid in memphis mind you which is now the world's largest bass pro shop i was gonna say yes. I, didn't, I didn't know the pyramid had been there that long honestly i, oh, I knew yeah. it was converted and it also has like the, what is it the uh the world's tallest elevator independ- freestanding independent elevator. or yeah freestanding elevator which is yeah. funny like i mean I haven't been there since it converted. Like I, I really just want to go for the the visual aspect. I do too. Uh, I oh, I've been. I remember because for me it was the Stones and Aerosmith and ZZ Top and Skinner and uh, just all of these other experiences. You know, I love that about this whiskey. This this whiskey is taking me to Memphis right now in my grandfather's <laughs> suit. Memphis is a great town. It's, there's so much. It's it's a it's a big part of American music story. Uh, Memphis. And we, we claim it in Mississippi. We call it North Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's probably more accurate than Tennessee. I, I mean, it always just seems... No, I wouldn't say they're like the bastard child or the step sibling, but... It's got it, one foot in both, no doubt. It, it's still far enough out there to where like, oh, that is in Tennessee, isn't yeah. it? It's a little Arkansas, too, though. It's yeah. right there, you know? You were born in Mississippi. We know how much you love Memphis, but... Your dad was a banker. Your mom was a teacher. Were they musical? Like, what made oh, yeah. you get into music? Oh, yeah. I sing. Actually, this EP that just came out, I talk a lot about my dad. And one of the seminal musical influences in my life is my father. Uh, my first memory of music is sitting. Uh, he's a drummer as well. Uh, sitting on his knee at his drum kit and him letting me bang on the Tom Toms and seeing his cover band play a show and one of the guys that played guitar sang Werewolves of London and played the solo with his teeth. And that was the that was like one of my earliest memories. And I just remember in that moment going, I don't know if this is an option when I'm an adult, but if this is an option, that's what I'm taking. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I want to be this when I grow up. And my dad and I have had this sharing of a love of music, whether it's the Beatles and the Stones or uh, all the great country music that the concerts he took, they took me to see Vince Gill about 10 times. And Vince is my North star as far as country goes. And, and beyond, really. but And my mom taught piano back in her college days. And uh, my dad always sort of put the dream in my heart. And my mom always helped me find a path to get to it. And that's how their musical spirits uh, influenced and shaped, you know, guided me. I think it's funny how people have these musical connections. Because I remember how much my parents listened to Vince Gill growing up. And then my first weekend, fully living in Nashville, my parents came down you know, help me move in. We happened to go to the Opry and guess who was hosting the Opry that weekend was Vince. Vince, Of course. Right. I just remember like how much that meant to them. They were like, Oh my God. Like out of all the people we get to see Vince Gill. And then now living in Nashville, as long as I have, I'm like, Oh, well, I mean, he's going to be at the station in. So if right. y'all want to come back down, you could get a hell of a lot closer yeah. to him than you would have at the Opry. Yeah, very. that's very nice. Na- that's such a Nashville thing. Yeah. I mean, if you know the time jumpers are going to be at 3rd and Winsley or the station in, you're going to know where to find the guy. That's, that's so true. So start sipping your second. We'll Here still we talk about everything. All right, I'm at cruising altitude now, y'all. I'm ready to, <laughs> ready to take this thing. I'm ready to let my, my uh, tray down. <laughs> and extend. I'm not going to extend the seat back because it's courtesy, right? I'm not going to put that on the person sitting behind me, but here we go. Yeah, how do you feel about I? Because I don't think the seat should be able to recline on an airplane if, unless you're in first class. Oh, by the way, oh, I just had a sip of that, and that's really good. I, You know, I, I, I think it all has to do in how 
you handle a specific situation. If you know you're sitting in front of a tall person, don't put that seat back. But a 45-minute flight and a six-hour flight to London is two different stories. Two different stories. If the whole plane is sleeping and you're not seated behind a six-and-a-half-foot person, I think you got some leeway. Yeah, I don't know how John doesn't just block that. I mean, I've been that asshole most flights that I've been on. Wait, 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 wait. No, I put my knees in the chair. That's just me sitting. The person in front of me is not reclining if they want to or not. It's probably not as bad as like having a kid in your lap and them kicking the shit out of the chair over and over and over. But (laughs) plenty of times I've seen folks look because they think the chair's broke. Right. And as I see them look, I just kind of give like the shit eating grin of, yeah, but sorry, not going anywhere. Dude, that's right that's here. perfect airplane etiquette to me. Like the kind smile that sort of says, you're just not going to get anywhere with this and I'm not going to be mean about it, but I think that's fine. Yeah. You know, it's like sending the, you know, a drink across the bar to a chick and she gives you a look like, thanks for the drink, but yeah, don't come talk to me. Like, <laughs> respect it. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, for me, I'm. Not only 6'3", but I was a lineman. I'm not getting my tray table down if you go ahead and lean that seat back. So I, I will I will make your life hell. But what do you think about that one? Because that uh, is a direct correlation to something you put in your notes. All right. You know, this, I want to pour this over my waffles, man. This is like, this is my kind of sweet in a whiskey. And it's got a good little burn happening. Almost like caramel to me but not it's not that sweet just a hint of it i really like it it's very smooth for me if i had to guess this is one of those old whiskeys like an old weller or something that i should know more about but i'm just i'm gonna throw my i'm gonna be bold and i'm gonna dare to fail greatly in my guesses and just say this feels like it could be an old whiskey we love that you're gonna do that you are not correct but all right we love keep it up (laughs) keep doing it this is actually Bell Mead Honey. Ooh. So this is the latest Craftsman Cast release from down the road at Nelson's Greenbrier. It is 52.68% ABV, 103.3 proof. What they do is they take their whiskey. Truby has filled one of their whiskey barrels with honey in order to barrel age their honey. Then they give it back to them yeah. when it's done. As far as finished whiskeys go, because you said you liked some finished whiskey, this one is one of the shorter finishes that they do yeah. because the honey kind of just goes right in and takes it's care of it. It's just enough. It's I love that. And uh, Dickel does a similar thing with Tabasco barrels, and I'm into it. But, I, you know, so same as Bellmead Bourbon? Yeah. Okay, and I love Bellmead Bourbon, actually. I probably didn't put it on my list because the last time I drank Bellmead bourbon. I drank way too much of it. And I was like, I need to take a break from this for a minute. But I love this. I usually wouldn't go for something like that. Like the the honey, sweet, whatever whiskeys are not something I would choose, but this is delicious. There's a lot of distilleries that are putting out, I mean, too many in my opinion right now, because Bellmead was one of the first ones to do it. Nelson's Greenbrier with, with their Bellmead line. Now there's a lot of NDPs, which is non-distilling producers, which you're sourcing the whiskey. And technically, Bell Mead is coming from Indiana. Riding those coattails. Yeah. Ain't to be riding no coattails. Same thing happens in music, too. Oh, and it gets it gets me. Oh, it gets to me. So you mean hard. the people that don't write their own songs? Well, no, no, just... no, because I've cut outside songs. That's not it at all. And, and if you're ever going to cut an outside song, this is a place to do it with so many great writers. But I, what I mean is if, if you see some, some particular style working that was true for that person, and then you think, oh, well, that's where the you're chasing, right? It, like It's a chasing move. I, I'm not a fan of chasing. You and, mean when everybody started trying to sing like Adele? Well, I guess that would be a thing. I guess it could be a thing. In country, it, it is country singer X has hit with a song about ABC, a truck, and the story goes like this, and da 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 and then next thing you know, there's eight more of them. Well, even like trends and lyrics. I mean, if you trends li- and lyrics. If you, right. if you, to me, if you listen to the radio, I get it because at least in my mind, I, I halfway grasp that the amount of writers on that scale 
really probably aren't that many different people. You may have a plethora of artists, but I, I think writing wise, the ones that get to that level aren't that many and they all many. get in the rounds together. So the, if nothing else, they hear other people's ideas and subconsciously it's stuck in your mind. But I, I feel like there's definitely parts of verses, maybe not necessarily a chorus. There's definitely things leading into a hook. They're like, isn't that what... The- last two damn songs said i mean and i'm not yes. knocking it because it it flows well but you're like yeah. some somewhere somebody heard this and the seed was planted and it just kept mm-hmm. going and to be fair sometimes that's nobody's fault because house that built me for example that song was seven years old when it got cut so some of these songs may have been written prior to the other song that had that lyric on the radio first but yes my whole thing is if i hear a rhyme whatever it might be Instead of going, ooh, I should use that, I have the opposite in my brain. I say, okay, that's been done. I don't need to do that. I need to go elsewhere, you know? I feel like there's no difference lyrically between bro country and rap for me. Like right now, if you think about the way that things used to tell a message in in both genres, you basically had you know a lot of hip-hop telling an actual story of what was going on country was telling a story about what was going on in their own way with bro country and hip-hop right now i feel like it's all talking about popping bottles and girls there is some of that with different furniture what excites me about the connection between bro country and uh, hip-hop is the musical phrasing and melodies because if you think about it, Roger Miller and Jerry Reed were were spitting some very fast lyric delivery. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, even, shoot, chug a lug, chug a lug, <laughs> chug. I mean, he's just going to town, you know. And so there's there is a precedent for it, and I find it really exciting because it's like when I went from Mississippi to Boston to college. Here I was having grown up on Vince Gill and BB King and Skinner and whatnot and bluegrass. And I was bringing that into this international environment where I was introduced to South American grooves and African grooves and uh, different types of music from all over the world and learning the common threads we had and like finding out what of all of that, like a banjo might sound cool on. And, And there is born something cool and new and interesting. And so to me, I do get excited for the musical similarities between the two lyrically. And, I, and I'm a bit of a lyric count, I think, because I always played music. I knew I needed to do my homework lyrically. So I feel like I, I study lyric writing more because the music is just more second nature. But yes, lyrically, it gets tiring sometimes. But the musical side of it excites me. And you also sampled local fare like the Dropkick Murphys and the Pixies while while you were up there as well. Man, one of those concerts at the Pyramid, Aerosmith, man. Come on, that's some Boston rock right there. One of my favorite live music memories is uh, there was a snowstorm, and it was dead of winter, and two of my closest friends, a drummer and a bass player, I somehow scored this gig at a place called the Thirsty Year Pub. It was in the basement I mean, it's the size of the kitchen we're, we're sitting in right now. It's in the basement of a dormitory building for professors on the MIT campus. We set up, we have to get cabs that are like sliding across the Mass Ave Bridge to get over there and drag our amps out and stuff. And we start playing. And before the first song is over, the bar is getting the phone call and the professors are pissed because, you know, they're, we all are making noise. It's too late. But like, by God, we had. We had made the trek in the snow and like we had like eight of our good friends there and, and four more strangers and like we were going to have a good time. So we just kept turning down and, and the, the quieter we got, the more intense the music got, <laughs> you know, and eventually we had to stop and, and whatnot. But it was one of my most just favorite memories of live music. Oh, man, that whole stretch, man, is full of some quirky rooms for for bands to play. Well, I know Zeke has a question, and you go ahead and drink your third one. Here we go. As we're going this through. Is very, this is going to, uh, if you've planned your questions out based on the level of inebriation, then I should maybe be worried. We have not. <laughs> I could tell you I don't have, one of the things that we pride ourselves here on Dad's Drinking Bourbon is we don't have set questions. We always want the conversation <laughs> to just. Shoot from the hip, man. So I jotted down 
like my notes kind of say you were born in Jackson. Like here are your singles. I was going to ask one thing I was thinking of was like you cut a music video for Fist Through This Town. What the hell was it like to cut a music video in 2021? And do you just expect it to go on YouTube? Like that's the type of stuff that I... I'm excited to get to that one. Well, we we can definitely talk about it, but I I know Zeke had something. Come on, Zeke. I had something at some point. (laughs) I don't know. You you kept moving at the time. Um, Something I at least wrote down. You know, you, you mentioned the um, the the parental influence on music. I definitely get that. Uh, like my dad, he always came in off the road late, and like you'd wake up like ten or eleven o'clock at night and hear something on the turntable. It's like it's forever just engraved in you. Um, like what obscure bands have you always prided yourself on like being familiar with? Like for me, it's uh it's Little Feet in the band. I'll take both of those. Like uh, the, the, those, that's my two ringers. I can throw if those out any obscure. And you know it's crazy. I love. Well, for you, people our age, obscure. There you go. <laughs> I mean, most of my catalog, the Staple Singers, Booker T and the MGs, all the Stacks stuff, all the Muscle Shoals stuff. Man, I, I may have to go with Little Feet. But you know, I had so many mentors. These bar bands that I played in when I was in high school. These guys were sort of regional musical stars. One guy who took me under his wing and would take me around to all the juke joints and stuff in the Delta and always knew where the, where the party was at. I don't mean like the party. I mean like the musical goods. Yeah. Um, but he played with this guy named Sean Lane, who was a Memphis legend and like way, definitely way out there in terms of not music for mass consumption, like crazy over the top, like a lot of notes guitar. And I just can't play that many notes on guitar so I would hesitate to say that Sean Lane was like my thing, but you couldn't deny the genius of it. And he he played a cover of All Along the Watchtower that was next level. And one thing about Sean Lane that will help sort of just explain his stature in the world of guitarists is Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top would, would seek out Sean Lane gigs in Memphis. And like there are multiple accounts of Billy Gibbons just like sitting on a bar stool watching Sean Lane and he'll get to the climactic moment in a solo and literally like knock Billy Gibbons out of his seat <laughs> just with holy cow this guy. So I mean I it was all that kind of stuff. But man, I'd have to I'd have to put the staple singers in there. Their music keeps being more and more of a touchstone for me, uh the older I get. And we just my wife and I love Mavis Staples too. She's sort of our our spirit. Yeah, I think Whitney's yeah. mom was in the Staples. Whoa, that's crazy. The, the more uh, you know. I didn't know that. S- somewhere in, uh, if you watch the, the Last Waltz with the band, which yeah. I've seen oh, too it's so many good. times, it, but it's an experience everyone should endure for sure. You can't see it too many times. Well, um, but no, so they didn't you know the, the songs that didn't make the, the actual show that they play later, when they, they play the, the Wait, and it's yeah. with the Staples, whoever hits the best notes, that's Whitney's Houston's mom. I'll be dang. Wow. Was it uh, Sissy Houston? Is that yeah. her name? I, that far, I interesting don't know. story. I always know my dad was always like, you know, that's Whitney's mama, right? And I'm like, huh? <laughs> interesting story about Sissy Houston, which ties to Mississippi. Midnight Train to Georgia, which is up there for me on all time songs. Uh, everybody knows Gladys Knight uh, and the Pips version. Well, it was written. The song was written by Jim Weatherly, who was an all star quarterback for Ole Miss the same year that James Meredith. Uh, desegregated schools in Mississippi. Like literally J- Jim Weatherly was like hunkered down with the national guard in one of the campus buildings in the middle of all of that turmoil and had the red carpet rolled out for him for a career in athletics football career, turned it down to be a songwriter, had this song that he had a record deal and, and cut for himself called midnight Plain to Houston. The <laughs> song gets to sissy Houston and she says, "Oh, Jim, that's a great song, but you got to change it, man. It's got to be. It's, first of all, it's got to be Train, and second of all, nobody's taking that to Houston, man. It's got to be Georgia." <laughs> and so, Sissy cuts it, and then not much happens with that version. Not that long, like I think it's later that year, maybe within a year. Gladys Knight cuts the song. The rest is history. But uh, so they both had to have got writing credit for that. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know in a situation like that if that would have been the case. You know, I've cut outside songs and say, can I change a word or whatnot? Some people are different about that. They're like, I changed a word. You need to give me credit. But I don't know. I don't know. 
Plus, I thought back in the day before, uh, before lawyers ruled the world, too. Yeah. Well, there's that factor. <laughs> it's all about the relationship, you know. It, that's the other. It's all about that relationship and, and mutual respect and, and all of that. But. I also think just in sitting with you for the hour that we have, you don't seem like an ass where you would, you know, like if it's in the spirit of collaboration, yeah, I couldn't right. see you being like, Hey, you got to put me on that. You yeah. Know? Look, if I really contribute to a song, I, I would expect credit, but you know, th- the way I see it, I have a golden ticket, man. I got a record deal and whether I write the song or somebody else writes the song, I get to be on the cover. I get to play guitar on it. I'm probably playing the guitar solo. I will be playing the guitar solo. You know, I'll be going out on tour. I'll be selling the T-shirts that have the song title on them. That's that's a lot of the pie. That's a lot of the pie to get to participate in. So you know, and Nashville's a beautiful community in that there there isn't really we ain't got time for that shit, man. We ain't got time <laughs> for assholes in this town. You know, so like you kind of you, you are encouraged, highly encouraged to be kind in this town, and that's a good thing. I think there are so many correlations between the whiskey industry and the music industry. Like this is more back in the day, but in Kentucky, you know, if something happened and still broke, you know, they wouldn't be calling within their own company. They'd be calling over to the other distilleries Mm -hmm. and it would be, you know, Elmer T. Lee calling over to Jimmy Russell going, Hey Jimmy, you got this thing for my still? And then he'd come over, you know, like it would be one of those things. And and they were all going to eat with each other. And, you know, the the Nashville that people that live here know that not everybody gets to see is like all these songwriters have sessions together. They're all going to eat with each other. Like it's it's very much a small community. Oh, yeah. And even with those of us that are not in the music industry, everybody knows someone who is working in it. And such and such a friend is in this band or such and such just did a studio session with this band. And like everybody knows people, everybody's looking out for each other. And I feel like if you've lived here for a few years, everybody's really good to each other. You know, that's the truth, man. And because you never know to the person opening for the other person, it'll, it'll flip in five years or whatever. And, and all of that is, just the lottery factor of this business and um, it's out of our control. But what we can control is, you know, our hearts and our intentions. And, uh, and I think most folks in the music business understand that and, and sort of uh, subscribe to that philosophy. And, well, let me put you on the spot for a second. And I know you're still drinking through whiskey. Number no, three. I'm into, I'm so into three. Are you asking me how to, well, no, before, think? before then, cause you mentioned opening. So you've opened for Miranda Lambert, Wade Bowen, Brad Paisley, Randy Hauser, Kenny Rogers, Brandy Clark, and more. Who's been your favorite person to open for? And I know you can't pick favorites. I know that's like an asshole question to ask you, but... The first tour I ever landed was 10 dates on Taylor Swift's Speak Now tour. And I didn't have a record deal when I got the call to be on that tour. And it's a big reason why I have a record deal. And the lesson I learned from Taylor, number one was how hard you have to work after everything happens, <laughs> after you kind of win the said lottery. The second lesson I learned was how to treat people because her entire organization, top to bottom, everybody bent over backwards to take care of me and my band, could not have been more generous. And that all came from the top, you know. There are so many favorites. On the, on the other end of the spectrum, it's hard to discount the impact of opening for Kenny Rogers. It was his farewell tour. It was in the UK and Europe. You could sense the devotion of the crowd every night to him. And what I learned in being on that tour was part of the reason for that. Throughout the decades, Kenny always made a point to tour in those countries. Not everybody else did. And they recognized that, I don't want to say sacrifice, but I mean, it is, it's, nobody says, I want to go out on my first tour. I want to make a whole bunch of money. Let's go to the UK. Because you, <laughs> you got a whole bunch of gear. You got to ship a long way further. And then you just got all kinds of mess to deal with to get over there and, and to plant your flag across the pond takes a lot more. 
And Kenny, not only would he continue to go there, but he didn't stop like in uh, Ireland when they were going through the troubles. He'd go tour Ireland and he'd go to Northern Ireland. You know, he he stayed true to his fans. And so I saw the reaping of what he sowed on that farewell tour. And that was a big lesson. Also, the power of what you call a career song, like The Gambler. Come on, man. Well, I mean, the whole tour was basically he knew when to fold them. He did. And he he was he was folding <laughs> it just right. Well, <laughs> Bad jokes. I'll, I'll, no, I'll, come on. That's part of what this is. Um, but I mean, man, you know, I think about like on the Brad Paisley tour, the the it was me and then it was Randy Hauser and it was Paisley. And like, man, if I had to pick a drinking buddy for from a tour, like it'd be Randy Hauser, you know? So there's just so much to glean from each one. It's impossible to pick a favorite, but those would be some highlights for sure. I felt so bad. I think it was probably like three or four years ago, maybe even now, like a CMA Fest, Kenny was playing. And like during the course, it like botches up on the gambler. I'm like, oh, fuck, like... How do you botch that up? Like it, it, it's your one thing, and he got like look like the band kind of like doubled down again on like playing it again. He just kind of like skipped a word and kept going. I was like, oh man! Like they always say, you know, like when you see like one of your like heroes fall, and it's like. Whew. Well, I'll say this, and I've never <laughs> told this story, but we played two shows in London on that tour, and here's where he proved me that he's a he was a freaking pro. The second show in London was at the I think. They call it the Hammersmith Apollo. And the outside, the backstage entrance is where they shot some of the in- opening scenes to Hard Day's Night with the Beatles. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely in a blue collar, like rough and rowdy part of London. A fight had broken out in the middle of his set <laughs> in the balcony. Like it was just a weird night. There was a segment where Kenny would come back and pull a, a stool up and sit on the stool and tell a story and sing one of his songs. He went to pull the stool up and he just missed calculated where the stool was. <laughs> and he, but look, oh, but it broke my heart. I mean, we were all freaking out and nervous and worried and he fell, but here's how pro he was. He's on his back. Everybody is thinking, oh my God, this guy's just broken. He's got <laughs> so a spinal cord injury or something. The band's still playing because the rule is when you're in the band, you keep playing, man. It don't matter what happens, you keep on playing. And the band's still playing and the, the it rolls around in the next verse and you just see him. He's sitting there and he lifts the mic up. <laughs> And he sings, he doesn't miss a beat. And I was like, that is a freaking pro move. And of course, the crowd just like stood up and was like cheering like crazy. And it was awesome. And it was heartbreaking at the same time. But it was it was a mark of somebody who, in a moment that I would imagine was vulnerable and in some ways embarrassing, he did the absolute coolest thing he could have done. Oh, yeah. I, I felt know. so bad seeing it. like, oh, I mean, he, but it happens he, he, to he, all he of us. picked it up and kept going. But it's it happens like, to all of us. I've been in the middle of singing my songs and I couldn't remember any of the words, you know. Oh, I've started songs a half a step off, you it, know. It is funny, too, though. Like, um, if you travel Europe and see the influences that random people from the States have there. I mean, I remember like went to Germany mm-hmm. and you always hear like everybody talks about Hasselhoff and Hoff. Yeah. And I swear, I mean, you, you think it's, it's made up in bullshit. It's and you, real. You get there and like, why is he his mural like spray painted on a wall on this random brick building like in the middle of a ghetto? It's like, yeah, nobody was lying about this. This shit's real, huh? Like, yeah. How did this one person make that big of an influence there? And yeah. here, I, I feel like he probably couldn't walk in public and not be noticed. But still, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that dude, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So what did you think about number three? I'm really loving number three. I feel like I'm starting to understand what the malt factor is. And I I hesitantly want to say that I'm getting that because it's a sweetness, but it's not a sweetness like the last one. You're 100% right that it is different than the last one. As I don't know as much about music as you would, this is one of those things where we can share knowledge and help you understand whiskey a little bit more. Yeah. So this is different because it is a weeder. So that means the second primary grain. So it's always going to be corn. Bourbon has to be 51% corn. Right. Instead of having the second grain be rye, it's wheat. Okay. And that wheat is going to be a little bit sweeter. So this is corn, wheat, and barley instead of corn, rye, and barley. Okay. And this is the one that you didn't know if it existed anymore. This is Weller Antique 107. 
It is 53.5% ABV. This was actually a private barrel pick selected by Elixir Spirits in Spring Hill, Tennessee from a couple of years ago. I really love it. Part of me was like, man, if I had to just drink one whiskey the rest of the night, I think it might be this one. I'm really loving this. Zeke will be happy to know this. The second I read that, I actually opened up. I did not have any open bottles of Weller right now. I opened one up because I was like, Charlie has to have some. Well, thank you. It's got a little bit of everything I love about whiskey in it. It's it's very well-rounded for, for my taste, my palate. I think I just learned something important about my whiskey inklings. I may be the opposite of you, and, and <laughs> weeder might be my vibe. Well, I mean, just I'd say simply the, the purpose of that mash bill is – Theoretically, from using the wheated grain, it's much more softer, less imparting, and therefore a much more enjoyable or consumable whiskey as opposed to the bite or other aspects that some things may get where rye is your number two grain. Rye is going to be a little spicier. It's almost going to feel like pop rocks in the front of your palate, like right by your mouth. and. The one caveat with wheat, though, is it will take longer to age. So if you have a younger wheat, it could be a little harsh, mm. and it, it might take an extra year or two in the barrel. So you might need to age it five, six, seven years if wheat is going to be predominant okay. in there. Fun facts all I'm around. I'm loving all that I'm learning. I do want to talk about your new album at yeah. some point. Before we get into that, one thing I would say is, like, I mean, you're extremely talented musically and anybody who's been to berkeley college of music you're going to know they're very friggin' talented at what they do the fact that you did a temporary stay in old crow i mean that is a very technically sound band the way that they play if anybody who plays bluegrass and that kind of americana style music i mean you have to be a little bit more talented i mean i know you play guitar mandolin what else do you play over the years i've actually I mean, I've always written my own songs and played my own shows, made my own records, uh, but sort of paid the bills as a session player. And whether it's on the Eric Church Chief record or the, the double album he just came out with or whatever it might be with other, you know, a lot of the country folks, but uh, I come from that bluegrass background. So the chair that I occupy more often than not is what we call a utility player. And that's usually acoustics banjos mandolins that kind of thing sometimes i'll play electric on records but the utility player just kind of grabbing whatever is needed so in that capacity i i own and play a lot of instruments but i wouldn't necessarily jump on the stage with those instruments i tend to just stick to guitar or whatever and the beauty of playing an old crow and and catch secor would would almost fight you on this. It's like, oh, it's not bluegrass, it's old time, you know. But uh, bluegrass and old time are brother and sister, you know, from way back. And the beauty of being in old crow was I was kind of bringing in my bluegrass opinion to an old time band. They hipped me to some cool old acoustic music that for a guy that grew up playing cool old acoustic music. These were influences I'd never heard of. And Catch in particular is just such an entertainer. Cut from a cloth that you just don't see that often these days anymore. I mean, it goes way back and, and it doesn't lean on production trick or fog machines. It's like I got a, a bow to my fiddle and that's that's going to be my wand. I'm going to use my jacket as a prop and I'm going to, you know what I mean? And, and so... The lasting impression from my year with Old Crow was uh, just finding a, a long lost brother in Catch, and um, and finding a, a country music audience that I didn't know was out there, folks that are just eat up with it, you know, and just so all about the music in a way that when you're used to, like I was playing shows for more mainstream audiences, I just didn't know that th- that there was that much depth in the country music audience that it that it went that broad and that really fires me up because it tells me that there are a lot of different country music fans out there and and i feel like i speak all those different languages and i want to sing to all of them you know i kind of live more on that side you know more the americana side than the top 40 when i listen to your catalog like 
I hope I'm stoned is like immediately I'm like, all right, that's my jam. Right. Oh, like, yeah. That's the that's the thing that I'm going to. That was actually one that you recorded with Old Crow. It was an awesome song. Oh, it was fun, yeah. I digress. We're talking about your new album, and then you're drinking the fourth whiskey. Oh, I'm about to, yeah. I think it's kind of funny. Like Your career is almost like leap years, because you put out Rubber Band in 2013. Mm -hmm. Four years later, you put out Beginning of Things in 2017. And then four years later, you're putting out Sugarcane mm -hmm. here in 2021. Is there something to that about every four years? I wish I could say that it was planned. It, it isn't like some whiskeys. It just takes me a little longer to, uh, to age things. And to get all my ducks in a row, and I don't mean the songs on Sugarcane are nearly four years old, but I have this relationship with Warner they recognize I am not necessarily the flavor of the moment. Uh, I'm coming in from a little left to center, um, but I have a unique offering to give the format. And labels don't tend to hold on to folks who don't sell a lot of records out of the gate. <laughs> and I have not sold a lot of records out of the gate. So we we take time, you know. I've got an A and R person, Chris Lacey. Uh, she's to me the gold standard for A and R. But f for folks that are like, what what is A and R? It's just that's the person at the label who kind of has to sign off on what the songs are going to be, and and you know, do we have what we need? She sets a high bar, and and I set a high bar for myself. So it tends to take a lot longer because where you know somebody who's got a hit on the charts, they're thinking, man, we got to have the next song right now. It's not so much a game of go write me 200 songs and let's pick the greatest, most perfect one from that batch. It's like, what do you have right now? Because we got to keep this train rolling. Because my commercial train hasn't so much gotten rolling at full speed, uh, it takes a little longer to you know star me up, <laughs> if, you, if you will. Uh, because every time I'm sort of starting over a little bit, they're uh, keeping their powder dry basically Warner is, you know <laughs> my daddy's told me that like for years that yeah that's one of his sign offs is uh all right boy keep your powder dry yeah but it's true you know because because most folks in my shoes i think if i didn't have the the respect of warner that i have that you know i'd have been dropped a long time ago because i just i haven't sold that many records but they believe in me and they know they've got something and they know they got the goods and and they know i'm going to keep working hard and I haven't made the same record twice. I'm really proud of each record. But every time I go in to make a record, you know, if I'm going to make a mistake, I'm going to make a new mistake. If I'm going to try something, it's going to be something new. I'll stand by all, all three of these records, but I'm growing and evolving and pushing myself. And Warner's trying to make the best, smartest decisions they can because they are the traffic cop at the intersection of art and commerce. And at some point, they run out of ammunition there, you know. So we're trying to play a long game in a business that even though it kind of does work as a long game, we, we have short game vision sometimes. I totally get that. And when I listen to your catalog, though, I, mean, I think you've made different albums and different records. But to me, there is an element of sadness mm. across all of your songs. Like even the songs where I would think you would be pissed off and angry. It's almost like a sad ballad, like you lost a girlfriend. Mm. Like Fist Through This Town, it still has that sadness like you were just broken up with yeah rather than being like if i'm gonna put my fist through this town i'm gonna put my fist through this town like i'm gonna put a hole in it do you get what i'm saying like it's yeah it, it, what what is that like well the you know with fist through this town i think it's it all comes down to that second verse you know and the guy singing is talking about the person he's with and just saying you know because i've already kind of laid out at that point what it is about my journey that's frustrating but i'm turning to her and you know, I'm coming in from my gig or whatever, and there she is coming in from her bar shift. It's like she undresses in the dark, a barely burning fire, another long night of short tips from the drunks and the vampires. So I'm not just upset about my stuff. It's that they're not being fair to her. And so that does make me angry in a different way. It makes me sad in a different way. What I think part of it is, is that I, um, I think the anger and that sadness and the fear are all connected. 
And uh, I, I haven't ever done fear well because getting angry, anger was the tool, the closest tool that I could grab, get a, a hold of and use. And as long as I was angry about stuff, I, I didn't have to own up to the fear I had that maybe this won't work out or whatever. But the crux of that whole song is that I'm starting to recognize it's not just me. You know, I might be I might be introducing the idea of that song as here are the things I've struggled with, here's what I'm frustrated about, but like I'm really singing about what you, the listener, is dealing with. And I'm really singing about what this person I love, what I see them going through that I don't think is right or fair. And the empathy in that, you know, so I, I, you know, there's a great songwriter in Nashville named Tom Douglas, and um, he has this great analogy of there are two kinds of music. There's forget music and remember music. And most of the time, what you hear on the radio is forget music. It's like, forget about what's going on. There's no future. There's no past. It's just this moment. And usually it's like, let's hook up. You know, that's like the, that's the general narrative of forget music. And it's valid, you know, it's totally valid. There are some great forget songs out there. I naturally speak and remember music. And that's House That Built Me that's got sadness in it. It's got a past. It's got a future. And it requires a little more of the listener. The listener's going to have to invest their heart in that song when they hear it. And that doesn't always fly up the charts as quickly. Well, I don't even think it's it's about flying up the charts. I mean, I, I think there's something about a hook, even in forget music and remember music. It might also be kind of a sign of the times, like of, of what's going on. Like, what are the things that have been going on the past couple of years? It's like people want to forget. You know, there's either people that are upset about politics or they're upset about pandemic or they're upset about what's going on in the world. And there's this subset of people that don't want to remember. They don't want to be sitting there thinking about it. And when I listen to your music, it's like I'm thinking about something. It may not be necessarily what you're singing. It's just that mood. It's never a surface interaction. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there, like you look off in the distance, like, I wonder what so-and-so is doing right now, or mm-hmm. like something that you did in the past that you might not be so happy about, or, mm-hmm. you know, wishing maybe if I took a left when I took a right, like mm-hmm. that's the stuff that you think of when I hear your songs rather than like, yeah, we're going to go down in the hallway and, you know, we got a 30 rack and, you know, we're all going to have a good time. Like that, yeah. I love that about music. Like I love how music will make you feel a certain way. I think there are some people right now that just don't want to feel Numb anything. me out, man. That's, yeah, for sure. To like go way back uh, a few minutes now to like old country versus new country. I think it would seem to me that most of the old country, quote unquote, even if it's not that old, was more of just what was on your mind, what was going on. And, and a lot of it came from the heart and soul, whether it be upbeat and all my rowdy friends are coming over tonight mm-hmm. or any of the countless ballads mm-hmm. that are just teep down sad waller in your beard booze mm-hmm. whatever and I, I think now a lot of it i don't know if it seems forced but it's written with a goal in mind versus written with what's coming from the inside mm-hmm. if that makes sense absolutely and i think there are a lot of forced leisure songs you listen to some of those lyrics and you're like all right yeah i knew you were going there you know like well sure you know but there's and, and therein lies the comfort and the familiarity of forget music. And there's not going to be any surprises. You know, my wife and I are, are, we've been, obviously with the pandemic, we've been binge watched everything, but we're binge watching Golden Girls <laughs> and The Sopranos right now. And like you, you put on Golden Girls, you don't have to think, you don't have to invest anything. It's just like, there's nothing's going to surprise me. This is just going to be an easy 20 minutes. You put on an episode of The Sopranos, they're going to throw some curveballs at you. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. You're going to get stressed. <laughs> Hit rewind. Hold on. I missed something. <laughs> exactly. What, what do they say? What do they say? Oh, my gosh. Go back. Go back. Was that something I missed? And so, and that's it in a nutshell, right? And both legendary TV shows, but two totally different things. Well, and I think of Brandy Clark, mm-hmm. who you toured with, you know, If I Die Young. That is definitely a remember song, but also has that catchy hook. Somebody could mistake it for forget. And when you yeah. really listen to the lyrics, you're like, oh shit, this is deep. And that's the trick. That's yeah. what you want to try to get is both. If you can get both in a song, you're off to the races. I remember just randomly going to my, my dad likes Jennifer Nettles. 
and he happened to be in town visiting and Brandy was opening for her at the Ryman. So I got us tickets and then she was talking about that song. And then when she played it, opposed to when the band Perry played it, I looked at it in a completely different way. That connection you can get with the people and, and sometimes it is doing it live and and that's something you haven't been able to do in a long time, but it's like yeah. getting people to actually feel that song a little bit more and it's mm-hmm. grassroots. Like a hundred percent Zeke and I were a grassroots podcast. I mm-hmm. mean, we started and was one guy telling another guy like, Hey, you check these dads out. They're actually honest. That is a thing about your work though, that I would say there is a tremendous amount of honesty. And with that honesty, it's not always going to be number one. Like we are not the number one show, Mm -hmm. but I almost feel like we are the alternative sometimes to that number one where you're going to go look and be like, all right, there you go. That's it. Yeah. Not saying the other guys, we're, we're friends with the other guys. It's not saying they're not real, but it's like that speaks to me more mm-hmm. than the forget music. Mm-hmm. You know, you've been drinking the four. I'm into the four, man. It reminds me a little bit of the last, it's different than, than the last one, but it's got that, uh, is it malt? I mean, malt is there. It is one of the grains. An interesting thing, like you like beer, I did not put those in here, but something that you might want to go look at is Chattanooga. They have that Tennessee high malt, so they put a high amount of malt, and they actually have multiple specialty malts that they put in there. It is a younger whiskey. It's you know three years, and they actually just put out a four-year bottled and bond, but that malt is going to have a little more chocolate to it. It's going to have a little bit more of that beer aspect to it. It's very beer forward to me. Yeah. Okay. It's not Zeke's jam, but I like stouts, but that is not what this is. (laughs) Oh, this just tastes, I mean, I taste the alcohol, but not in a bad way. I don't know what this is. I'm, I'm a little stumped, but I like it. This is Nashville Barrel Company picked by Dad's Drinking Bourbon. So this was a a private barrel. That is 109.04 proof, 59.52 ABV. So just a little bit higher than that Weller Antique, but we are still going up the whole time. I like it. This would be my kind of bourbon right here. You could see the the custom sticker we put on the side. I like it. That is the owner of Nashville Barrel Company (laughs) along with Zeke. If you've seen Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah. It's the Burdett Brothers. Oh, I love it. Oh, that's great. (laughs) I was about to say, man, y'all look like y'all get a gig on the Opry in those outfits. (laughs) So we were talking about this before, and and I alluded to the fact that this was going to be a question. You said you couldn't wait for it. What is it like shooting a music video in this day and age where like MTV doesn't play music videos anymore is it all about like getting viral on youtube is that the point you know i just i remember shooting the video for fist we shot three music videos in two weeks and it was a a a video for fist through this town uh, another song of mine called believe in love another song of mine called half drunk which is where you're going right now it is totally where i'm going maybe maybe more than half drunk i've been working for a long time with uh Sam Sisk on on my music videos. Each of these videos had some sort of touchstone based in my personal life. Like for Fist Through This Town, we shot a lot of it at this dive bar called Twin Cakes 2 that's amazing and just beautiful karaoke bar. One of the places my wife and I went for one of our first dates and and it tells a story of, you know, playing a crappy gig and then you know, you'd kind of dream that everything happens that you want to happen in this sort of hero sequence and stuff. But um, it is, you know, content is king right now. And so the way I see it is it's a chance for me to tell both my fans and people who aren't yet my fans but could be uh, as much as I can about myself and share that with them. And so with Fist, we used the location that was one of my wife and I's first dates with Believe in Love we shot the whole thing in one one take you know it's all one camera one take each little scene is full of uh little artifacts from my life whether it's the stuff that's on my writing desk at home pictures of my granddad or whatever we had this thing called a magic memory tunnel it was all these old home movie clips and, and stuff and a couple of drums from my dad's old drum kit from that first memory of music that i had um and in half drunk we shot it at uh station Inn, which is where i first told my wife i loved her and 
I just try to put as much of myself in those videos as I can because r- whether or not it is, you know, CMT or YouTube or whatever, it's probably the best way to reach people today because we're, we're consuming things visually. You know, even our audio, we kind of consume that with a visual element to it now. And I was really excited at the fact, usually you only do one music video. Like when I was making my first couple records, you make that first music video and then you wait and see what happens. And now they're like, no, 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 we should make three of these. <laughs> and I'm like, bring it on, man. I get, to, I get to make these little mini movies and tell people more of my story. So it was a great opportunity to get to put more of myself out there. And I, I like to think of it as, you know, you, you get, you know, the various stages, the entry level, somebody's interested or they've heard about you and they want to check you out, they go on YouTube. So that's, that's level one. You want to get them all the way to, I bought the concert ticket, the t-shirt and the vinyl. And along the way, you know, they get you on Spotify and they save you or whatever. And then all these different various things happen. But like, you want to get from YouTube to vinyl. That's my, my goal. That's interesting. It's still that important of a medium because, like personally, I'd, I'd always thought it would just come some kind of weird, like throwback, lingering around kind of thing. Like you know, you just kind of still have to do it because that's what you do to support an album. Um, like a big Kid Rock fan, that's probably an understatement. And every album, he still does you know like one or two videos. I'm like, who the hell's watching a Kid Rock music video? Like his fans are his fans. I don't see him watching videos, especially on yeah. YouTube. So it just always kind of throws me off. Like. Is it really that relevant still or just kind of like, you know, it's just what we do, right? <laughs> yeah. But that's a new spin. I, I appreciate that. Fun fact before you jump in. <laughs> yeah. The person that you were sitting next to was actually in a Kid Rock music video. Wow. And I did not try to reference that in any way. Oh, you know I was going to bring it up and give you hell. I mean, that is just stories that only happen in Nashville. It's yeah, like, what hey, video? It's a song about Tennessee. Okay. It's random. I'll look it up. It was one of those things like, hey, if you live in Nashville and you want to do this, uh, email this person. Uh, it wasn't like I I didn't do anything more than just fan it out completely. Yeah. But you stood right behind him. I mean, he walked in front of you. We talked about the weather. <laughs> hey. That was literally my, I got one like break in between things. And everybody's like, oh, did you talk to him? I'm like, well, yeah. I wasn't going to sit like a not on a log. Like, what'd you talk about? The weather. That was your question. Like, that's what country people do, right? I mean, it was a nice day the day prior. I was like, man, if it's been one day different, it's been a beautiful day out here, right? And he's like, you damn right it would have been. There you go. <laughs> How do you follow that, right? <laughs> you, you don't. I, I've interacted with Kid Rock once. I, I did this. I reimagined the old Ernest Tubb Record Shop uh, Midnight Jamboree during CMA Fest one year. And first two nights we did it at the old record shop that's been there since the late 40s and whatnot. It was awesome. We kind of got kicked out, though, because, like, it was way too many people. There wasn't <laughs> an adequate air conditioning system and all of that. And, like, all these great folks would come by. Vince came in and Brothers Osborne, all, all Brandy was there. But the third night we had to move to a different venue. And, and one of the guys in the bands, a buddy of mine, fellow session player, uh, they had just been working on a Kid Rock record. And he's like, I think I can get him here. I think I can get Bob, Bob here, you know. <laughs> we didn't know until the last minute if he would show up, but he did. And like right before we went on stage, we're sitting there in the green room talking, and he goes, "Hey man, do you like tapes or CDs?" <laughs> and I said, "Like I don't know, man. I guess CDs." He's like, "Can you see these nuts?" <laughs> <laughs> so there we were. That was my moment with with Sir Kid Rock. How, how do I? Fo- well, you figured out a way to follow Zeke. In a Kid Rock video, I want to talk about this album again. You're working with Jay Joyce for the first time yeah. as your producer. He changed things a little bit for you. Yeah. Only one guitar kind of made you do things a little bit differently. If you messed up, he wasn't going to let you do it over. I mean, there were things that he would steer you towards. Yeah. That might have been a little bit out of your comfort zone, right? For sure. I'd worked with Jay on Eric Church Records before, but never on my own. It's a whole different animal when it's your your project, you know. Um, but I, I trusted Jay, and in part because I'd worked with him before um, on other folks' records, but also in part just because I was a fan of, of his record making. And, um, and on the second of the two Eric records that I worked on with him. We were up in Banner Elk. This was early 2020 before everything shut down. And, and we had these days, because they were writing the song during the day and then we cut it at night. So I had all day to just hang out and kill time and we'd listen to records. And the more that I sat with Jay and 
he's like, have you ever heard this? Have you ever heard that? I kind of started to realize this guy has listened to more records than anybody I know. So I had a trust factor built in. And I, I recognized that I needed somebody to make it all a little less precious for me. You know, I have to be in love with every take. I have to be in love with every song, with every vocal performance, all of that. And Jay cares deeply about the record he's making. But the minute we get what we need, he's on to the next thing. There's no victory dance. There's no, wow, that was great. You know, it's just like, all right, what's next? And that was healthy for me. So he pushed me out of my comfort zone, but he did so as someone who I trusted also, as fellow musicians, we spoke the language. So when he needed to get me to a place, more than any time prior to that, I was in the room with somebody who could talk to me in that language. You know, like, no, 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 like this. You know, and just, I mean, even just like, I know we're talking in audio, but like I'm doing air guitar hands <laughs> right now. Like he could kind of do the the air guitar hand thing or like say, oh, this, this, that, such and such thing. And as a fellow musician, I, I was like, oh, oh, I know what you mean. You were like, go ahead and hammer here. Like, whereas, do, do yeah, something like that. Whereas a lot of times when you're working with a producer, they, they may be a brilliant producer, but they may not really play much music or whatever. And that's still totally valid. But sometimes as a player, an artist who's also a player, when they're trying to get that message across and they're, speak, they're speaking a foreign language to you, and Jay would get right down to it as a player and say, no, 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 it's like this. And, and immediately it clicks. And all of a sudden, I'm way more comfortable being pushed out of my comfort zone. And a hundred percent. I mean, I think the type of music that you have, there's something about not having it completely polished. It needs some carelessness I, it's to not balance even, it out. I wouldn't even say carelessness. I, I'd say Playfulness. Rawness. Maybe. Yeah. Like, and not only are you putting your thoughts out there, you're putting your heart out there. And, and for guys that are listening, I mean, it's not... He rocks. Don't get me wrong. It's not like sappy music, and, and I don't want it to... Very Skinner-inspired solos. Yeah, I don't want it to come across like I'm saying that, where I'm like, oh, you have the remember music and all... No, like, dude friggin' rocks. But it is raw emotion, and when you are, like, in fist, right? You're talking about the stuff that frustrates you, the stuff that frustrates you about how your girl's being treated. Like, mm -hmm. there's a rawness there that isn't necessarily polished. And mm. that is an awesome thing that he did. The second thing I want to say, I always love Eric Church has my favorite line in all of country music. And it's just like the way he says it. But in a uh, hometown where he's like, used to go down by the pizza hut. Yeah. Like, just the way he says that line, it makes me chuckle. Like yeah. and when I say it's my favorite line, it's like his intonations are so unique mm -hmm. opposed to other country music artists but i think there's a similarity between you and him and that's where i would say like yeah you know you're you're frustrated that it hasn't necessarily clicked yet but at the same time like think about him like he yeah. has saw none of his shit is forget you know no, and, it's true and look at the success he has and and look at what has happened with his career yeah. There's a great old C.S. Lewis quote, the longest way round is the shortest way home. And I'm taking the scenic route to stardom and it's making everything kind of more beautiful and more appreciated for me. So I fully resonate with that comparison. I mean, for Eric, you know, and for Miranda, but you mentioned her as someone I opened for and she definitely is one of my favorite people I've opened for as well, because I just remember on those shows at the end of the night, like, Everybody grabs a drink, everybody gets in the airstream, and they start passing the guitar around. It's like, all right, sing me a song, sing me a song, you know? And it's so inspiring on a creative level. But both Eric and Miranda, if I'm getting my math right, second single, third album, that was their first number one. Second single, third album. <laughs> That's not normal. But by the time they had their, their big hit, they had already built who they were and who their crowd was so, so far down the road. And they had their thing going, you know, and I just think that that makes the journey so beautiful. And, um, you know, for me, too, like I had the chance to play on all these other records in the meantime. If I was a massive star right now, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I probably wouldn't have met my wife, probably wouldn't be a dad, you know, and I get to have that experience now. I mean, think about Miranda. Think about how many remember songs she has. Oh, yeah. But then she also comes out with Drunk and I Want to Go Home with L. King, and mm -hmm. that is a freaking banger. Like, that. that's one 
where you want to drive down the road, roll all your windows down, and turn that shit up. Oh, big time. I mean, lyrically, I, I think she's one of the best ones out there. I mean, like, I, I appreciate, like, taking in her songs, mm-hmm. regardless of the the tone to it. Like, mm-hmm. there's just funny, subtle thoughts put into it. That, yes. Like, you listen, and then you actually, like, repeat a lyric to yourself. You're like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's what she really said, and that was the 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 reference, the meaning. Like, oh, yeah, it's just a lot deeper than I thought. Here. Yeah. <laughs> so you have been drinking this fifth one. Ooh, it's good. I mean, at this point, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say it's my favorite. I think number three is my favorite. That Weller is going to be my favorite. Did y'all give me Jack Daniels? Uh, you can't say y'all. I don't know. Oh, I got you. Okay. You're like you're like oh you think it's good when you the way you said that I was like and I know I said in my all, thing I'm not all I know is when I went to pee earlier John opened up a random cabinet and had this funny grin on his face like I just poured some of Zeke's good shit somewhere no. well this is really I think this is really good <laughs> I just feel like I am past the point of having any discernment other than like I like this it is Jack Daniels but okay here's the deal all right here's the deal wait, I am wait open open the box. I believe your quote in the email was Jack Daniels is shit. <laughs> no, look, I've had this. I've had this. Now, and this now is good. but look on the side. Oh, my gosh. So this is one that we picked along with our other friends. We call it the wolf pack when we all get together. It is my face on Goose's body. It is photoshopped. Oh, I love it. Know. But... <laughs> It, whenever somebody says they don't love Jack Daniels, I believe that Jack Daniels single barrel barrel proof is one of the best damn things, if not the best thing to come out of Tennessee. I look, so Eric Church drinks this. When we were in Banner Elk doing that record for the heart and soul, that they had a whole wall of this stocked and we all drank it and it was great. When I was talking about Jack Daniels' shit, I'm talking about like eighty proof. Yeah. The, the old number seven. And the that's black why label. I'm such a fan of Dickel, because to me, Dickel is like the like the straight up, relatively speaking, the mom and pop. And like I'll take Jack I'll take Dickel's eight year any day over Jack Daniels. But the single barrel, it's a thing. It's a vibe. And and I don't often I like drinking whiskey straight, but and y'all might think this is sacrilege, but like if I was gonna do No, this is 133. We say drink it however you want to. If drink I was it. gonna do a whiskey and coke this is how I would do a whiskey and coke. Or even if you're putting a big old ice cube in there, whatever you yeah. want to do. Just- I, and, and, I, and I'm not a whiskey and coke drinker. I want y'all to know that. I have been to Patterson House, and they have a thing they call the Jennings, which is like a, it's it's their take on a whiskey and coke. But it's, you know, anyway, I'm probably digging myself in a hole here. Talking no, no, about- I mean, like, it, honestly, it is reverse of a spin of it sounds. To me, it makes more sense to put a 130 proof whiskey with a coke or any other mixer because you still taste it. Mm-hmm. If you put an 80 proof product with mixers or, or yeah. coke or whatever, your whatever the the alcohol is in there with the mixer, it's there just so you can say it's there. I mean, right. it, it's like a bragging right or some shit. It's, mm-hmm. it's not drinking for flavor. Yeah. Um, or or maybe an old fashioned. I'm a I'm an old fashioned fan. Is it 309 is right off of 5 points? Yeah. It's still there. I mean, I haven't been there in forever and a day, but we used to have a um, a, a Mexican coke with uh whiskey and they throw some peanuts in there with it yeah <sighs> man it's a vibe oh like the sugar from the mexican coke the peanuts the whiskey like i wouldn't call it a cocktail but it's if you didn't experience. like it I'd, I'd say you had something wrong with you yeah it's an experience <laughs> no totally and that's the thing about whiskey to me is it's it's not that you're just drinking something you're having an experience as important as the whiskey you're drinking is it's the conversation you're having around it it's the thoughts that you choose to process and go through when you're drinking it, you know, the, the whiskey you choose is in part, you're deciding, all right, same with music. You know, do I want to put on a remember record or a forget record? And I think the same probably holds true of whiskey. But yeah, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hate on some Jack Daniels single barrel. To that like back and forth thing, I'll, I'll throw this last one out there, especially you talked about having like videos done and whatnot. I feel like music is definitely a, an open interpretation. Mm-hmm. And you talked about, you know, songs that people did and covered. To me, I think about something like Nine Inch Nails versus Johnny Cash with Hurt. Mm-hmm. Completely different tones. Talk about Skinnerd 
I think about like Free Bird, but then like you see a movie like, uh, was it Devil's Rejects where they're going out at the end and it, it's a different feel. Like you're pumped up when you see it. Mm. As an artist, when you, you have a, a song that's out there and, and it's left to open interpretation versus having to do a, a video, and to, I guess especially depending on how much direction you have, how hard is it to let the imagery be someone else's or still be somewhat of an open interpretation versus what you thought of when you pinned everything down? Mm. Well, when I'm making the record, when I'm making the video, I want it in large part to be my vision. Once it goes out past that fence, it doesn't belong to me anymore. Yeah. And I'm all about it. You know, I, I love nothing more than for someone to come up to me and tell me a story about a song of mine and how it intersects with their life because that's the power of music. That's the whole point of, of it for me. And I do that with the music I love. You know, I'm sure that some folks who made the music that I love, if I told them what it means to me, they might look at me a little funny, you know? <laughs> but but it's But the music is meant to go out and become communal and, and become shared. And I think it would be really cool, like with Hurt, you mentioned Johnny Cash reimagining. You know, and I even believe that Trent Reznor at first was like, what do you mean? Like, he's, this is going to be a train wreck. And then he hears it, and <laughs> then he to. goes, oh, my God, this is beautiful. Like, wow, this is even more the thing that I intended. And so I, I just, you know, and I, I joke sometimes that when I'm writing songs, I'm printing lottery tickets, you know, <laughs> and and literally they, because they literally can be, I mean, Don Schlitz, we talked about the gambler, Kenny Rogers, the guy who wrote that song, Don Schlitz, I, I was uh, a part of his medallion ceremony when he was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. And I, I sang a song of his called Oscar the Angel for that ceremony. That was not a very well-known song, but just spoke to who he was as a person. But the story of the gambler is that Don Schlitz was working the overnight shift at Vanderbilt in the computer lab back in the 70s when computers took up whole rooms. <laughs> he was trying to be a songwriter during the day and hold this job down at night to pay the bills. Nobody gave a hoot and holler about his songs, and he had this song called The Gambler, and Bobby Baird recorded it, Johnny Cash recorded it, but it was at a time when Bobby Baird and Johnny Cash couldn't get arrested, and nobody cared, you know? And uh, and get arrested. Sorry, he kept. No, it's true. And, that's and, just so good of like a subtle like throw it in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's one of them sayings. Um, and uh, Don got a letter about uh from his boss, basically saying, you know, we have caught you falling asleep on this overnight shift. If it happens again, you're gonna get fired or whatever. We're getting ready to fire you. And right then, Kenny Rogers records the gambler, and from that moment on, Don. He could have stopped right there and been fine. That's a lifetime song, right? That's an I will always love you kind of song. But he kept going and he kept writing and everything. But the gambler was that winning lottery ticket. And the minute the gambler became that winning lottery ticket, became everybody's winning lottery ticket. You know, it's whatever you bring in to, from your life to that song. And so I'm just out there printing my lottery tickets and maybe there's a winning lottery ticket in there for me and for everybody and, and maybe not, but maybe there's like some, some scratch off wins in there for like individuals <laughs> where that song touches an individual. And Hey, if, if that happens one time I've, I've won, I've done my job. And sometimes it's okay to win the Tennessee lottery, but not win mega millions or there Powerball. You go. it's all putting it in perspective. Like if you get a certain amount of money, that's still F you money where you don't have to worry like other True. people do for the rest of your life. Right. Right? And unless you do what most lottery winners do and just buy a bunch of dumb shit, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? But like Oh no, but you're married and have a kid now. You're not allowed to go buy I a wouldn't bunch want of dumb to. Shit. Honestly, you know, it's like I would want to travel a little bit, make some improvements to the house, but I first of all I want to pay off the house, put a bunch in savings. But like it it, it speaks to the fact that we're probably not meant to have winning the lottery be a, an experience human beings have. That's just not it. And that's the thing. I, you know, I'm in a group of uh, other artists, and some of us have platinum records. Some of us are just starting out, and most of us are like me. We're somewhere in between. But our saying is that uh, public professions create abnormal amounts of, of stress. Uh, unaddressed stress leads to depression, anxiety, addiction, loneliness. I mean, you name it, you know, uh, all these bad things all of which kill creativity. Well, creativity is the gift that got us here in the first place. 
Therefore, we have signed up for a career designed to kill the gift that got us here. And so uh, the lottery element of this career, you have to kind of take with a grain of salt. You have to hold it at arm's length. The truth is we're all here doing our thing. We're trying to get better at it, just like a great whiskey maker. And sometimes you end up Jack Daniels, where any corner of the world, their shittiest whiskey is right there on the shelf because it has to be because it's popular. And it actually takes away from the fact that Jack Daniels makes a really beautiful whiskey in their single barrel. And meanwhile, you have George Dickel, which to me, their bottom shelf brand of what they do is light years beyond what Jack Daniels entry level whiskey is, but they're not the rock star. And none of that makes sense, right? At the end of the day, it's like, who are you drinking the whiskey with? And how does that whiskey taste to you? And where does it take you? You know, it might be Jack Daniels 80 proof and I can't knock a person if that's where, if that's where that song, that whiskey or that song takes them. But I like Dickel and, and I like Jack Daniels single barrel too, apparently. So, well, you know, there you go. It takes all walks. That's right. It does. It takes all the, all the crayons in the in the box and we give each other a fair amount of shit on this show so the second i saw that email i was like he's getting our latest pick but i love it i i do have to say we hope you win that lottery ticket just listening to you hanging out with you you're super talented love the new album and i i think other people need to find it too so go ahead and check out his latest album sugarcane Fist Through This Town was the first single. Half Drunk is the second single. Uh, there is a third. What's the third uh, single? Believe in be- Love. Believe in Love. He already shot three music videos. Find Charlie, social media, his music. I love I opened Spotify up and it said Charlie Warsham just added a new song. It actually says that. Oh, uh, that's cool. So check him out. Listen to his music. Support him because as you can tell, he's good people. I have an hour and 50 minutes of audio where I told his people this was going to be 45 minutes. So I'm not going to get it down to 45 minutes, but I will cut it down. I'm interested to see where this will end up. Zeke, the folks can find us on Facebook at Dad's Drinking Bourbon, Twitter at Bourbon Dad's, Instagram at Dad's Drinking Bourbon. We could keep talking to Charlie forever. So thank you so much for spending some time with us. Zeke, where else can the folks find us? Good old Music City, USA. Cheers. Cheers, y'all. Ciao.